Okay, just as a quick comment before I call up the speakers, I know some people just recently received uh, a device that will allow them to hear this in translation. If the speakers that have filled out speaker cards or any of those who desire to fill out a speaker card uh, would like to have a spokesperson or more than one spokesperson, maybe two, speak on their behalf, they will be entitled to speaking longer than three minutes. Sometimes that's more effective than allowing individual speakers just three minutes to speak on the item. Is there that desire to do that amongst the speakers? Okay. Mayor, I'm of the opinion that if the individuals fill out a speaker card, I agree with Mayor Pro Tem that they've come, they've taken the time, and if we're going to make a determination that these 10 speakers wanted to speak on exactly the same thing, I do not feel comfortable doing that. I'd rather sure. hear them, even if they waste a little bit of the council time. I don't have a hot date, and I don't think anybody else here does. We should allow them to speak. Okay. And hold them to the three minutes. Okay. All right. Ana Lopez. Ana Lopez to be followed by Rafael, and I cannot read the last name. It might be Cortez. Good evening. I'm just uh, upset with the housing department because we're having a lot of issues uh, with our housing. Housing department uh, promised to help us uh, with our housing. But we're under a lot of stress because we haven't gotten any help from them. We've ended with, in the hands of an a agency called Paragon. We talked uh, with the person at Paragon, but this person is never there. And all the, the colleagues, uh, neighbors are very stressed. And we just want some help to be heard. It's very hard to find a housing. It's really hard. Our batches are expiring for a lot of people. And as the days go by and we are unable to find anything, we get very stressed. That's what I'm asking from housing is to get the help they promised. Because the time is going to come when we're out without any, without any housing. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Wiggins, if I could just ask you a quick question in, in regards to comments that were made. How long will the Section 8 vouchers that have been distributed to the residents that are being relocated, how long are those vouchers valid until, and are there any extensions that could be granted on those vouchers? Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor, uh, Pro Tem, and members of the City Council, the technical response to your question is 120 days. However, uh, we have up to a year. These are called displacement vouchers. They're special vouchers that we receive from HUD because of the demolition of the 260 units. And as I said before, we will not put anyone on the street, we being the housing authority, until such time as every family is moved. The bigger concern that we have is the safety and welfare of the families that are staying as units are becoming vacant. That's our concern, but we will be there for them until such time as every family has a unit. So they're not, the vouchers are not going to expire and they're going to be without housing assistance. It's a matter of them staying there by themselves and having pretty much a ghost town as we go forward. Thank you. The next speaker is Rafael, and I think the last name is Cortes. I'm not sh quite sure. Rafael? I'm Rafael Cortez, and I live in the 
esposa. I live with my wife in uh, 105. <coughs> and we need help because we've been looking for a place to go with two bedrooms and we haven't been able to find anything and we need help because the time is about to expire we have until June and days go by and go by and we don't know what to do so we're begging you if possible to help us out uh, I would be very grateful thank you Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Wilkins, a quick question on, on seniors. If I, I know that some of the uh, residents that are being relocated are senior citizens and they have extra challenges beyond the other challenges that are present. Have we made contact with Sycamore Senior Center and or I know we have a consultant managing this, but have we as in the housing department do we know specifically if there might be vacancies at the Sycamore Senior Center, which I know would probably take those vouchers, um, and the other senior centers in town? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor, Pro Tem, and members of the City Council, um, I, am, I cannot stand here and say that we have absolutely made contact. I believe that we have, but I'd have to speak to with uh, the staff person that's responsible for communicating with Paragon. But that would be a logical location. Uh, there are a number of our residents who have already moved, one of which I am certain moved into Sycamore Village, and a couple others moved into um, Gateway. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next speaker, Fatima Navarro, to be followed by Ilda Navarro. Good afternoon. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Ilda Navarro. I'm the daughter. Um, yes, as, as this gentleman has um, said, they do receive uh, letters or cards stating about different apartments and their availability, yet some of the senior citizens that have been placed in those homes don't need, um, I mean, either they can live upstairs or they can live in different types of uh, housing. But uh, as my parents, they are disabled and they need something downstairs. And the units that we've I've helped them look for either is a year's wait of uh, two, I mean, it's too long for them to wait, and yet housing, the vouchers that they presented are only for a one bedroom, um, and then they don't give the amount. Because I've actually talked to managers and of, of different apartments, and they say as long as the voucher has um, some type of, like, the money worth or something like that, that they can move into a two, per, uh, two bedroom no matter what with the voucher. But these vouchers only have a one bedroom or two. It doesn't have, like, the equivalent of the money. So, I mean, if they were to get maybe a different type of voucher that they do give the Section 8 with the money, and maybe they can use those um, to get regular housing or regular apartment. Thank you very much. And I can't respond directly to your comments, but I might just add to uh, Mr. Wilkins that I do know Mr. Wilkins because of the Americans with Disabilities Act that the Sycamore Senior Center has many seniors that are on disability. In fact, they've qualified even some that aren't seniors to live there because of their disabilities. And I know that they do accommodate seniors, whether it's on the first floor or any other floor, to make sure that they accommodate their disabilities. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, and just want to make sure that um, uh, that was Ilda for Fatima. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker, Jose Ortega, to be followed by Elea Serrano. That could be Elsa, but I'm, I'm not... I, I'm, Good evening. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, good evening. I'm sorry. I apologize. We're having a housing issue. Uh, I apologize. As it's been said previously, we're unable to find housing. But the initial solution was the one that was uh, given to us by them. 
de la construcción en, en Las Palmas uh, para 64 the, the building in Las Palmas with 64 rooms esa era la solución indicada that was the solution for para las personas que iban a the people en la sección 2 that were going to be uh, evicted in section 2 but they, they changed uh, what they were uh, decision in the first and second stage. And that caused the issue of that we have uh, presently of not being able to find a room. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I just got a message from the uh, property manager of C uh, Sycamore Senior Center, and there currently are no openings so at Sycamore Senior Center. So we'll continue to uh, make our efforts. Uh, the next speaker, um, again, the first name I can't read 100%, uh, but the last name is Serrano. Hola, buenas tardes. Uh, I'm going to need help in Spanish. Good evening. I'm going to need help. I just want to show you this for starters because I don't can have I can't have any contact with the public. It's for the public to know. This card was prepared by people who live there. And the questions to which the director is given here answer Con todo with all my due respect. Si if you remember, two weeks ago, you were told that these cases were going to be shifted to Paragon. Entonces, ¿cómo están so how can you be sure what Paragon is doing? Because we had a meeting two weeks ago with the people living at the projects and what we heard was completely different. Paragon is making them sign if they go to refuse to move to Section 8, they get pressure to sign. And some of them have said that they have received threats because they have prepared a letter where they say they don't want to be transferred to Section 8, that they want to, re to remain in housing. One of the Paragon employees told them that unless they came to the office to sign, they would get the signatures from housing. We've been here repeatedly to let you know that what's happening at the projects, but you haven't listened. The director is here. Where are the Paragon people here, which are the ones that are really managing this situation? Paragon doesn't show up, doesn't answer. The people keep making complaints, and then you ask the housing director, how does he know that what Paragon is telling him is true when the people here are saying it's a lie? There, it's happening to elderly people, to mothers with kids with disabilities, to adults with disabilities that are unable to find a place here in Oxnard. Senior Walken said last week, two weeks ago, that these were people that want to remain in La Colonia, which is a lie. They are unable to find an appropriate place for their needs in Oxnard. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Walkins, quick question. Mr. Wilkins, uh, again, I understand that there is 
um, a third party that is working directly with the residents to help with the relocation efforts, but you have given us presentations before the council that indicate that people fall into a couple categories. There are some people who want to stay just in the Colonia area. There are some people who do not want to move at all. Um, so if there's an alternative, they don't want any other alternative. They want to stay where they are. And then there are those people who have Section 8 vouchers that are, are finding it hard to uh, get other entities to accept these Section 8 vouchers. Um, do, do you have a count currently on, on where that breaks down? And you are good to give us that, that update. Uh, you've done that several times now. Do you know where we are right now? How many residents do not want to move at all, approximately? Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor, pro tem members of the City Council, I do not have a, an exact count I'm not sure if um, Carrie has better numbers than I do, which is absolutely none. Um, good evening. The number of people so far that have said that they do not want to move and do not want a Section 8 voucher is approximately five. Five households. Yes, and some of those are, are opting to actually move on their own. They don't want the voucher for that reason, and some are just not wanting to move, period. And but of there the, are very few. And of the five households that are currently there, um, even working with them individually, and I think it's going to be very important that we do that, um, uh, are there, you know, there must be some gray areas in between about not wanting to move, but then if they knew that there was a, a nice alternative and they could visualize that, be taken there, that that might change their minds. Do you know how many people in those five units that we're talking about total? I don't know that. Okay. And then of the people that are having problems with Section 8 vouchers, um, uh, do, you, do you know what that count is? Um, I don't have a count on that at I this see. moment. And how about the people that just want to live in the Colonia? Um, did you have a count on that previously? The report I gave last week. Uh, we don't know. We don't know. Because it changes every day. We're not quite sure. It, it changes. Okay. I see. On a continuing basis. And Mr. Wilkins, just a quick concern, and I know members of the council will want to weigh in on this also, that... Thank you. I understand we have a third party doing this. Uh, there was a comment made by a speaker that um, people feel uh, threatened um, or um, compelled or, or coerced to, to sign agreements and this type of thing. Um, could you comment on that? Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem and members of the City Council, um, this is news to me. No one's being coerced. And, and here's what may be the, the confusion. Uh, the third party company that we have uh, has an individual on site, as I indicated before, every day, Monday through Friday, from about 8 until 5. That's their contact. What staff is advising me when I talk to the application staff and I talk to the public housing staff is, is that unfortunately we have residents who are wandering into the office literally and asking them questions about relocation and we try to urge them to go back to Paradigm because that's the company that's dealing with the relocation. So with respect to being forced, when you go forward and you've got a displacement voucher, it's the same thing. I've heard someone earlier say that there's a difference between this voucher and the other vouchers. They're all the same. The identification is, is that this was exclusively given to the housing authority for the 260 units. Uh, there is no difference between the two. That being said, we are encouraging, strongly encouraging our families to take the voucher. And if they don't want to take the voucher, certainly if we can find a public housing unit, they can stay there. But those families that are opting to leave without any type of, uh, as I call it, security, I am concerned about because they'll be back before you in a year and a half saying that they feel as though they've been wronged by the housing authority. They will not be able to go into those units. The reason for the vouchers, the reason for them staying in public housing is to continue forward with supporting them. Those that opt to leave and say that they no longer, because they're being asked to sign a statement, and that may be what some of the individuals are communicating. They're being asked to sign a statement that says, I am no longer interested in public housing or Section 8 assistance. Those are the only individuals that we would be speaking with and having them sign. Mr. Wilkins, on that point, Ned, I'm glad you clarified that. Yes, sir. Are they being asked to sign a statement that says that they're no longer interested in Section 8 vouchers and public housing, or, 
and or because what because some of them some of them I as I understand are having problems with section 8 vouchers because maybe they're not being accepted or maybe there's an issue with that but they're not necessarily not interested this is my understanding in coming back to this public housing project could that be the case that they have a problem just with Section 8, not with coming back to the project. And those individuals are being advised that if, as soon as we can find them a public housing unit, we certainly will be able to do that. Now, I, I want to clarify this point. We are not a large housing authority. There are 780 units. Approximately one-third of those units are being demolished. So we go from 780 down to five-something. Uh, our vacancy factor is not high, as is the case in Ventura County. So it's not as though we've got a slew of units that are sitting there waiting for people to move into them. You know, fortunately for us, it's a highly desirable place to live. So that being said, is what I'm saying to you is, is that as we move forward with those clients who are saying they want to stay in public housing, it's only on availability. We can't move someone out of their public housing unit and say, oh, well, here's a place for you. Last question. Um, the, uh, over the weekend, there was an uh, article about a thousand people waiting for units at Cabrillo, the new development at uh, at Wagon Wheel. Do you know, Mr. Wilkins, whether the city was able to coordinate with Cabrillo to take some of the residents uh, that perhaps are having some issues and lead them in that direction with these new units? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor, Pro Tem, and members of the City Council, we did in fact meet with Cabrillo and their executive staff approximately three to four weeks ago uh, and had a discussion relative to the availability of units at Wagon Wheel. They advised us they would be building 119, of which approximately uh, 69 were already spoken for by the individuals living uh, currently on that site. The other 50 units we asked, well, would it be possible to set aside any number as low as 20 for our clients? And they said, no, it's only going to be on a first come, first serve basis because their concern was the, look at the legal issue of setting aside units for any population. And so for that reason, it was first come, first serve. Uh, we did pass that information on to our residents. Uh, the third party that's being utilized, uh, the relocation office, uh, provided flyers specifically to all of our residents. And they had an application period to pick up applications. And I believe that was at the PAC. And they were supposed to, as everyone else, show up on Saturday at uh, the um, Cabrillo's offices in Ventura. And I, I would, don't want to prolong the issue of Cabrillo, but I, I find it sometimes um, unfathomable that the taxpayers of the city of Oxnard and the housing authority and, and uh, city staff are attempting to facilitate that these units are, are built and that it's our resources that's, that are building these places and that, that these places would not be reserved for Oxnard residents. I just, it's an unfathomable thought that we would spend our resources to house um, other people, other cities, uh, affordable housing population and not our own. I, and again, I'm not asking for legal um, uh, dictate or a legal explanation for that, but I just find that really hard to, to swallow. Mr. Mayor and Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of the City Council, in defense of Cabrillo, I'm not going to suggest to you that uh, the applicants that uh, were standing outside for those four or five days were not City of Oxnard residents, because I don't know their application process. They may have been. That's not some information I would be privy to, so I don't want to say that they were outside of Oxnard. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, Juana Zambrano to be followed by Esperanza Martin. Marquita. I got the section 8 but I've been looking all over the place and there's no it's not um, it's full or I can't find any but it's hard for me to look for a place to live you know and I haven't had any help from the housing that helps you I Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Esperanza Martin to be followed by Belinda Franco. 
Disculpa, es que es español. Eh, pues ya lo que yo iba a hablar aquí. What I was going to say here has already been said by my colleagues, but I repeat again a little bit of it. Initially, we were told that our units were going to be demolished, and we were promised that initially that it would we would be relocated to the Las Palmas Park. And that from there, we would be removed. And that as there were units available, we would be relocated. And why, if that property is available, why don't you start there? They want to evict us from our units, but there's nowhere to go. We haven't been able to find any housing. And I don't want Section 8. I've never wanted Section 8. I want housing. And let's see if you can help us to uh, keep your promise. Thank, Thank you very you. much. And Ms. Burnham, the, the housing staff, just to announce to the speaker that the housing staff is here in the audience, and perhaps uh, the housing staff can meet with this, not only this uh, fine lady, but the other um, speakers to uh, answer as many questions as they possibly can or provide whatever assistance they can. Belinda Franca, or Franco, to be followed by uh, Jose, uh, and the last name I'm having problems reading, um, I'm going to say uh, Ramirez, but I'm not sure. Good evening. Look, I have been disabled for many years. As a matter of fact, I have housing for disabled people. So I can barely get out to look for an apartment. I have to be going to therapy to visits. I do get out to look for housing, but not as I should. So, if it's going to be a Section 8 and there's going to be also housing, I never applied for Section 8. So I, I think I have the right to continue having access to public housing. And I also live with my mother. And I, 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 there are several things I need to have in my bedroom for my therapy. And now, I've been told that we'll be getting one bedroom for both of us, which is not going to work. That's it. Thank you very much. Jose Ramirez to be followed by Juan Jose Rangel. Good evening. My issue is as has been said previously, I'm in the place where they help out elderly people. It's an issue that we've had from the beginning. We've been having this issue. 
we've been asking for help for the elderly people. We were told that we would all get help, but we haven't seen any help either for them or us. We want facts, no promises. Thank you. Thank you very much. Juan Jose Rangel to be followed by Juan Delgado. Good evening, uh, Mayor, uh, Council. I'm Juan Jose Rangel. I, I was the clerk at housing for three years, but beyond that, I want to talk here today for the young people who can, are unable to come for the teenager. You can ask uh, Mr. Winnaker if he knows uh, how many families have te teenagers that if they get relocated or go to Lemonwood and if they said before living here I lived at La Colonia what's going to happen we know that uh, progress has to happen we agree with that but if they were going to build that project why they didn't take in, this into account he never met with us to ask us what we thought he did it on his own and now he's facing the consequences I believe he should have learned from this and for the next time in which they go forward with a project as big as this to take into account the people who live there a lot of the young people live there not because they misbehave just because of the fact that they used to live in La Colonia are going to have issues so if someone suffer damages collateral damages I don't think this is fair for the young people I know this is very tiring for you but th thank you for hearing us we're desperate a lot of families have teenagers and they all have the same concern thank you thank you very much uh, mr. Wilkins uh, a quick question on the on the timing is July 1st the, the the goal at this point that everybody has to be out by July 1st or is it June 1st Mr. Mayor, Madam uh, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of the City Council, uh, there is no goal to move everyone out by June or July of this year. Uh, at the earliest, and I would let the developer speak for uh, his company, or Urban Housing Communities, uh, it may be as late as uh, December, January, that uh, we will be in a position to uh, start the project. So there's no, there's no urgency for June or July at this point in time. And that's what I've been saying, is that uh, we, are not, we will not proceed until such time as all of the clients have been relocated. And, and a last uh, just question, because you've said this before, part of the reason, no, the reason why we're here this evening and why this issue has come about is that the units at Las Cortes were deemed to be uh, uh, impossible to save is that is that a correct that you could just restate that that the units there were built from gunite that this material uh, in many cases there were deplorable living conditions and or um, irreparable uh, you know many cases where the buildings in fact just could not be repaired is that correct Mr. Mayor and uh, mem uh, Mayor, uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of the City Council, I agree with everything except for impossible. Uh, nothing's impossible if you're willing to spend the money. Uh, and it would have cost significantly more, my understanding is, to simply do the rehabilitation of those units, which is pretty much taking them down to bare bones and bringing them back up again. So uh, with respect to the asbestos, the lead-based paint, the mold, and all of the other uh, conditions in the units, you're absolutely correct. And they've been like that for quite some time now. And uh, with the asbestos and the lead paint and some of these other substances that have, that have deemed to be toxic and harmful to humans, um, it is largely speaking impossible to remove those those substances when in fact they're the, the whole being of the of the building it's intertwined throughout the whole building it's not like removing a door that might have lead paint that could be an instance but it's it's a case where the whole building had these toxic substances is that correct that is correct sir I see thank you mm -hmm. <clears throat> Juan Delgado to be followed by Martin Jones
Good evening, uh, Mayor, uh, Council members. Um, again, same thing. Another 1,000 people lining up for three days, camping, even posting, no camping, sign there. They were still doing it, you know. One of the persons mentioned that the soccer court from Las Palmas was going to be used as a, to begin building the, the units for these people. What happened? You guys changed the plan, and now you got, got this problem here. When the recession went through, a lot of people lost their home because that, some people from that area moved out. Then they couldn't make their payments because some idiots were making so much money on them. Selling them a, a, a fixer uppers for $480,000. They couldn't pay the, the, the payment of $4,000. Then they went over there. They were worried because the court enforcement said that the house wasn't up to the code. They spent another 15000 fixing the house. So what do you leave these people that want to get ahead? Nowhere. Banks don't care about the people. All they care is about their payment coming in. You miss two payments, they throw in the letters for closures. Same as the city. You miss your, 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 your water bill, you're trying to be shut off, and then $88 to be reopened again. People, we're running in, I mean, me, myself, I'm working uh, on a tight budget. And, and I have to pay you guys just because I'm four days late. I mean, I'm on time for the payment one day, but I already have the notice. It's going to be shut off if you don't pay within 10 days. And with a $88 fee. <laughs> Where's all this money you guys making? You guys are responsible for all this stuff. If you guys want to clean up the colonia, you should have told them. We're going to knock this day. It's going to be down. You guys got six months to move out. Get with it. But there's no units out there. You guys should have done halfway the project and then move the people halfway down the road and then until everybody is happy. Now you got problems here. People don't want to leave the area. They're going to have to because you're just going to have to build up the whole project, or you want to spend more money paying these people that are making money on behalf of these people, and they're not getting anything done. So what are you guys doing here? You guys got to work hard to. That's it. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Martin Jones, please. Good evening. Well, the mayor touched on it earlier. Uh, people moving to Oxnard and, in effect, freezing out residents that are already here, uh, moving from other cities to affordable housing in Oxnard. The problem, uh, the mayor has touched on this before several, maybe two or three times, at least once that I know of. In lieu financing, the in lieu payments, it was $5,000 a unit. I don't know what it is today. If it's still $5,000 a unit, other cities do not have to follow the state mandate of affordable housing. So they pay us $5,000, and we take their share of affordable housing. We take, we build residents, we build housing for people from other cities that don't want to follow the state mandate. It's that simple. If you want to have housing, for the residents of Oxnard, then you have to raise the in-lieu financing, the payment, the fee, from, say, $5,000 to $50,000 a unit, or even $100,000 a unit. That will force the other cities in the county and the state, for all I know, to build their own affordable housing and keep residents that are here now here in the city of Oxnard when we build affordable housing. Simple. Thank you very much, and um, that concludes the speakers. I just want to note to anyone in the audience, this is a public hearing. You're entitled to speak. If you're interested in speaking,
please approach the city clerk with a speaker card. Okay, if no one else would like to speak, then I would ask for a motion to close the public uh, testimony portion of the public hearing. So moved. Second. Okay. Second, Ms. Martinez. Mayor Pro Tem Ramirez. Aye. Councilman McDonald. Aye. Councilmember Padilla. Aye. Councilmember Porello. Aye. Mayor Flynn. Aye. Okay. Uh, members of this body uh, perhaps have some comments that they'd like to make uh, before we actually adopt a resolution approving the issuance of the bonds. Councilwoman Padilla. I'm, I just had a quick qu two questions from Mr. Wilkins if he. Um, might be able to humor me. Uh, I have, just so I have a clear understanding of the process. So I know that a lot of speakers mentioned that they don't want Section 8 vouchers, that they want to be moved into hou public housing units. So my understanding currently is that there aren't any public housing units available to have the residents be um, moved to. And because of that fact, they are being offered these vouchers in order for them to be able to find residents in other um, in other units is that correct so it's not a matter of us not wanting to put them in public housing is a matter of the fact that there aren't any housing units and in lieu of those non-existent housing units they're being provided these vouchers is, is that mr. 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 mayor uh, madam mayor pro tem members of city council and uh, specifically uh, councilwoman Padilla uh, in essence, that is correct. However, let me, let me go backwards on that. Every client that lives at, uh, within the courts has been offered the displacement voucher. That's the reason why we got them. It's because their unit is being torn down. Therefore, they're entitled to that voucher. We have some clients who have said, I don't want that. And you've heard them this evening. <clears throat> Those individuals, we are making an attempt to try to find a public housing unit for them while they're, they're still living within the courts. Some we've been successful and others are still waiting. So yes, you're correct. I see. And then um, I'm not sure who can answer this, but uh, I, I believe that's all the questions I had from Mr. Wilkins. Okay. But um, a previous speaker at some point said that we as a city take monies from other municipalities in order to build their housing units. Um, is that correct? Or I mean, is, is that even possible legally for us to bear the responsibility of other cities with respects to them constructing their public housing units? Um, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, um, Council Members, uh, Councilwoman Padilla, I believe the speaker was referring to the in-lieu housing fees that we, we collect from developers here in the city, not from other cities. Right. So, so each city is responsible, depending on their demographics, to build public housing units in according in accordance to their own populations correct I mean we as a city can't uh, you know pan or give our housing needs and our responsibilities to another municipality that's correct okay um, and I believe that's it I just you know my final comments is I, I'm, I'm hoping that um, that we as a city and the housing uh, staff can um, make sure that Paragon is making the dislocation process as um, easy as possible. I do understand that being dislocated from your house, I mean moving in general is a very stressful process. So I'm hoping that um, the residents of Las Cortes, in addition to the Paragon staff and our housing staff, uh, will work together in order to make this process as easy as possible. Um, we, I think we've done our best, the be best job that we can in order to provide a project that is going to improve the safety and well-being of those residents. Um, there is the option of, you know, uh, starting from scratch, but again, we lose the possibility. At that point, we'd have to, uh, in, we'd have to have somebody be interested in actually developing that area, and that would take more time and prolong the process a bit longer. And again, our priority, I think, at this time is the safety and overall well-being of the residents, of all the city residents. So again, I, I'm hoping that we can work together to make this process as easy as possible. And um, 
I encourage uh, the community members to, if there is anybody who is involved or can help, to come to housing or Paragon and if they can even translate for an individual or if they know of some housing units that are available to offer up their services and help ease the process as well. Thank you very much. Councilman McDonald. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just some general comments. Um, during my tenure on SCAG, which is Southern California Association of Governments, we go through a process called Regional Housing Needs Assessment, and SCAG represents the group that I was with, represented all the way from Ventura County through to the northern edge of San Diego County. Uh, so we cover the largest metropolitan area of, of the entire state. And going through that process, uh, other communities are, are made to toe the line in terms of uh, affordable housing. And, and I can tell you that there were quite a few heated exchanges when there were certain communities that didn't feel the need to have to do this, and they were forced into it by SCAG. We, we um, absolutely said, if you don't do it, your funding will cease. And I'm not going to name any communities because I don't want to start any more of the words, uh, but there are some communities out there that absolutely were, were less than cooperative. So others... Other communities are stepping up to this, but what we're faced here with is one of those catch-22 situations in that many months ago, we had a group of, of our residents come to us and say, our housing stock is deplorable. What you have, have us living in is falling apart. It's hard to fix it. We're not happy here. We're happy in the neighborhood, but we're not happy with the conditions. And as a city, we had to make a decision to try and proceed with this, with this program to try and replace that housing stock with livable, good quality housing. And that's what we're on the road to doing. The downside of this is, is that to do this, we have to ask people to be disrupted a little bit, to move. Um, and, and I realize that some people don't want to live in Section 8 type housing. Other people want to stay in public housing. That's great. I, I applaud that. But there is only so much public housing available. We're taking some of that offline in order to rebuild it. It's going to be a time of inc inconvenience for a little bit. Um, and I can assure you that no one is going to be thrown out of their housing. Uh, we're not going to have people living on the streets. And, and uh, I have weekly conversations with Mr. Wilkins about, you know, what are we doing to make sure that Paragon is doing what they need to do? Are we absolutely sure that no one is going to be homeless at the end of this project? Uh, and the answer I keep getting is yes. Now, unfortunately, Mr. Wilkins is, is going to have to hold it. Paragon's feet to the fire, and to some degree, his feet are going to have to be held to the fire, and that this is the commitment this council has made to provide good quality housing for our residents, but it's not an easy task to do. And I know certainly if someone came to me and said, you're going to have to uproot everything you've done for the last 20, 30 years, uh, that I would not be happy, and I fully appreciate uh, the residents' concerns. And I know that when you're dealing with governmental entities, sometimes we're not the most communicative in terms of, of being forthright, not so much forthright, but understandable uh, because of regulations that we have to comply with. But it is, and I believe my peers will say this, but it's the intent of this council to provide the best housing quality possible for our residents and to do it with as least inconvenience as possible. But there are going to be some, some difficult times. But the, the ultimate goal is to replenish, replace that housing stock that is 50 years old, if not older, uh, that is just not habitable anymore. And that's what we're trying to do in our, our best way possible. And, and all I can do is offer my assurances, and, and hopefully my peers will agree with this, that we're going to do everything humanly possible to make this as uh, smooth a transition as possible and not displace anyone from housing, period. But there's just so much public housing stock available, and that's the quandary we're in. That's why we're doing this, to, to replace what we have. Thank you very much. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Well, I'd echo those comments from my colleagues here. And um, I know it's very difficult and painful for people. The, what is before us today is the financing of the new units, which, again, are in dread. The current units are in uh, really uninhabitable shape, according to state law. And we know that because the uh, attorneys who represented the tenants who were here in these chambers some months ago told us so and showed us the evidence. We know, all know that. And now we have the quandary, how do we make this an easier transition for people? And I think we always can do a better job of communicating with people and creating programs that are for affordable housing, 
affordable housing is not always the most popular thing on everybody's agenda. It's ap absolutely necessary for us to have a civilized community where everybody gets to live here and not just uh, the super, super wealthy. So I really want to, I, I have to support this. We have to ha go forward with this program and even if I were not to support it, or the majority of the council were not to support it, it would go forward anyway. Uh, it's it's um, just necessary that it go forward. I am concerned about particularly what uh, Mr. Juan Rangel brought to us about, uh, we know we have issues between young people in our different areas of the city to make sure that uh, that is a proper relocation and smooth transition so that people are not put into, let's just say danger. Uh, by moving to from one community to another. I think we all have a part to play in that, but particularly I'd hope that our housing authority and Paragon particularly pay attention to that concern if it hasn't been addressed earlier. So I have to support this. I'm, I hear the residents who come and complain. I'm sorry that you have to keep coming to us and telling us how difficult it is. I'm, I wish it was easier. And um, I hope we can keep working on making it smoother transition. But housing out there is very tight for everybody, even for people with a lot of money. So we'll, we have to do what we can do and try to make this work for everybody and going forward into the future to have some better units for everybody to live in. Thank you very much. Councilman Pro. Number one, I want to thank the mayor for letting all the parties speak. Um, I think it benefits the council, even as, as hard as it is to hear these, these issues that these people bring to us, and they may not exactly have been on point for the topic on the agenda. So thank you, mayor. Um, one of the comments that was made by a fellow council member with respect to residents coming from other areas, I, I believe that that council member may have misunderstood Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones has been an advocate for a number of years, as long as I have been coming to these council meetings, with respect to the in-lieu fees being sub, the, not the correct amount. And by not having the correct amount of in-lieu fees to give to housing, to assist housing, we have put ourselves behind an eight ball. And um, I just wanted to, to clarify that. I believe Mr. Jones is right with respect to his comments on in-lieu fees. If I can ask a question of Mr. Lawson. Mr. Lawson, if the previous project that was going to be built and they would have started construction prior to the demolition of this project, there would have been a place for these residents to move to. Am I correct? Some financing fell through or a change in the markets or something? Uh, Honorable Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and, and members of council and Councilman Perillo, uh, I am not the proper person to be able to answer that. I believe you're correct. Uh, I was not intimately involved with the uh, initiation and who uh, Who would be? Uh, I would have to defer to my director here. Okay. At this point. Mr. Wilkins, please. Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor, Pro Tem, members of the City Council, and uh, Council Member Perillo, financing fell through years ago. Uh, we're talking this project, and I want to say it started maybe in 2007. Uh, there was another developer. The developer uh, ran up against difficult times when the, the market hit rock bottom, and uh, the city and the developer came to an agreement the developer walked away. That would be the only time that I'm aware of where financing was not available. Okay. Uh, with respect to the two, the, there's some confusion about how many phases that are out there. The Housing Authority is building what is identified as phase one, uh, and we're very close to closing escrow on the funding for that. Uh, that's the 65 units that we've been before this body and asked for your permission to go forward. Uh, that is phase one where there, it is vacant land. Certainly, ideally, that would have been completed, but we still have to do some demolition in order to complete that phase. Uh, phase two is the first phase of the uh, urban housing communities, which is what we're moving forward on the, um, the demolition and the, the relocation to get towards. That's the 114 units. And then phase three will be started after the completion of phase two. So there has been no uh, loss of funding or any of that nature over the last four years that I'm aware of. We've been working with the same developer. Okay. Um, thank you very much. 
the point that I was trying to get at is that the economic crisis that hit this nation, real estate, everything, if the city of Oxnard, if things had not happened with the economy nationally that did, we would not be in this position today, I don't believe. We would have had a stock, we would have had things that have been in place, and this might have been a seamless transition, might have been. It was not the intention of the city of Oxnard to displace people, but circumstances have transpired that this is what's happening, and as a council member has addressed, the city was pointed out pointedly that we had people living in substandard conditions, and we couldn't continue to do that. We put ourselves, the citizens, and the precious funds the city has at risk. So we've taken these steps. Um, Mr. Wilkinson, I feel for you. You're concerned for the safety of the residents that are left in these, these homes when there are vacant ones around there. And anybody that's been near a home that's been vacant for a long period of time, things happen. Uh, some people set them on fire. Some people squat. There's all kinds of things that happen. And so I, I thank you, Mr. Wilkinson, for being concerned for these people's safety. Um, I will support this. Uh, the issue with respect to finding these people homes, I don't have a solution. Um, I don't have a solution. But I'm hoping that the people that we have in place that are on the payroll for the city of Oxnard can assist. But I do not doubt that there's going to be some people that are tremendously impacted negatively. Um, and that is one of the reasons that I wanted everybody to be able to speak. This is something that the public doesn't want to hear about, and I'm sure the council doesn't want to hear about. I don't like hearing about it, but this is the reality of being in this position. You're supposed to deal with all the residents and all the issues in the city of Oxnard. The issues that the gentleman brought up about the youth, if, Ms. if Mayor Pro Tem had not explained, I would not have understood about the youth and having problems. We're talking about gangs. When you move one family to an area where there is a strong dislike for people coming from another area, you put kids at risk. You put families at risk. Our neighborhoods and our police department can tell you about that. The issue I recall years ago, former councilman, Mr. Andrus Herrera, making a comment that affordable housing was not supposed to be a multi-generational deal. There have been comments about the city's future with respect to affordable housing. Um, there has to be some sort of a come to meeting of God, this type of thing. And this is something that has to be done, ladies and gentlemen. We can't have people living in a situation where their health is compromised and the city has put at risk because the people are living in this situation and they potentially have a legal right to sue the city of Oxnard for having them live in substandard condition. It's been pointed out by our staff, by our mayor, by our fellow council members. I'm gonna support this and hope that we can assist everyone in getting their facility. I hope that the council member is correct. We don't put anybody out. But there will come a time when, when there's one or two individuals that do not want to leave, something will have to be done. And um, those are my comments, Mayor. Thank you very much. I, I want to reach out to um, uh, the residents that are present and maybe the residents that are listening this evening. Um, this weekend, when I read the article in the Star about the people lining up and camping for three or four days uh, just to have a shot at, at brand new housing, uh, it was a turning point for me uh, here in the city of Oxnard. Um, there are thousands of people in this city, and I would argue more than any other city in the county, and in fact more than all the cities combined, that are living in substandard housing, and they're living in conditions that are absolutely deplorable and unacceptable. Um, and um, they look at the members of this audience and the people that have public housing and have affordable housing as basically uh, they've won the lotto. They are you in this audience uh, are very fortunate people to be recipients uh, of this public housing and uh, of the assistance that's being brought forward by the city of Oxnard. And um, I'm, I'm sympathetic on the one hand. Uh, I see the face of workers in this audience. I relate to you. I'm from a family of workers, and I'm a worker, and I relate to working people, but I also think there's a way to turn this around psychologically, and I might want to preface my remarks to say that the seniors in this situation are the most vulnerable. So I feel a little bit differently about the seniors because, uh, for obvious reasons, but um, 
Sometimes we forget how fortunate we are to have the things that have been given to us. And um, as Mr. Councilman Perillo said, we, did, we had a councilman here that I served with for many years, and he talked about the fact that um, should public housing in particular have a time limit because there are so many people out there living in unacceptable conditions, horrid conditions in this city, conditions that existed in this nation a hundred years ago in New York City and across the nation, people are living right here in Oxnard, and the conditions that you were living in at Las Cortes were unacceptable. Uh, the buildings were unacceptable, they were they're not healthy, it's good that they're being knocked down. I hope we can get those things knocked down faster than anything in the world. But I also know that many people have lived there for a long time. They're attached to that area. Even if it's not healthy, even if it's not good, there's an attachment. There's not only attachment to the homes, to the streets, to the neighbors, to the relationships that have been built over all these years. But I really want to turn this around from a psychological standpoint, or at least offer some hope, that you're in a very fortunate situation. Again, it's a pain in the neck to have to move, but to be the recipient of taxpayer assistance places you in a very fortunate situation. Now, I was elected to serve everybody in this town. I haven't, I haven't met with any of you. I haven't met with not one of you. I've had some calls. I've spoken with some people. Um, I know that my distinguished colleague, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Ramirez, has, has met with the residents, and I don't know of the activities of the other council members, but I'm, I'm willing to meet with you, not because I have a magic wand and being the mayor of the city, I can just say, guess what, we'll take care of this just jiffy split, but I'll be honest with you, I, I want to get this resolved, and I know the council members do, and I know Mr. Wilkins. Um, who's been working diligently wants to get this situation solved. But I want to leave a parting thought. You are fortunate people. Even though the situation is not, this short-term situation is not fortunate, you are fortunate people. And you're fortunate to have people in this city, including me, including this council, supporting you, living in decent housing, unlike the thousands of other people in this town that are living in deplorable circumstances. So I want to offer, on the one hand, my sympathy, in particular senior citizens. I want to start with you first to find other places. I, I just got a text back from uh, uh, Phoenix. She's the landlord or the uh, property manager of Sycamore Senior Center. She said that next month, which would be May, there's a possibility that there'll be some openings, and that's for the seniors in this audience. So I want to reach out. I have not met with you. I would like to meet with you. I, this is not a grandstanding electioneering type thing. I have not met with you. I'm, I'm tired of not doing that, so I want to meet with you. But I want to part and say, leave this chamber this evening hopeful and realize that you're fortunate. So I'd like to um, then um, ask the council then, the matter's already been discussed, for a motion to approve on the item two, adopt a resolution approving the issuance of bonds. Is there a resolution? I mean, a, a, a motion to, for approval. So moved. And a second? Second. OK. Um, Mr. Martinez, Mayor Pro Tem, has made the motion. It was seconded by Councilman Prillo. Councilman McDonald. Aye. Councilmember Padilla. Aye. Councilmember Perello. Aye. Mayor Flynn. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Ramirez. Aye. Okay. Uh, that motion carries. And um, to the residents in the audience, the housing staff is here. The housing staff will be going here into the back and they will be meeting with you. And my intention, and I know other members of the council have expressed the same, will continue to try our best to help you.